Khalidur Neva is going to talk about simulation in medical education. Um, Khalid is a consultant trauma orthopedic surgeon, he's a, a GMC clinical trainer, um, and a foundation training program, an honorary lecturer and examiner at Teesside University, MRCS examiner at the Royal College, um, lab assessor and ATLS advanced trauma life support course provider. Instructor. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran, Dr. Muhammad. Shukran, Mr. Tugadi Mahana. I've got two good news for you. First is a very short talk because most of it is covered by other people. And the second good news is lunch after this. So uh, I'll be very quick, okay? Um, there's absolutely got nothing to disclose. Um, apart from my passion and care to education and learning. It's not just education, okay? Um, how many people here, if I can have uh, a show of hand, that deal with or dealt with simulation in their practice? Different types and style of simulation. Not surprised. Anybody else? Any simulation? Pharmacists here? No? Okay. I can, I can tell you, every one of you have an experience of simulation in a daily life. All of us remember how we learned driving. You get into the car, you try things, and maybe you smash a wall or smash a car or two, but that's a learning. But that's the difference. In healthcare, we're not allowed to smash people or hurt people. It's all about safety. It's a very fast-growing business, this simulation. It's not a technology. Simulation is not a technology. It's a, it's a technique. We'll, we'll talk about it very quickly. So we're going to describe some types of, I've never worked out the legal distance for this. Do you have a legal distance for this? This one here. OK. Describe the uh, type of simulation available for use in clinical practice. Uh, we're going to demonstrate how teams of healthcare and professional can integrate. Uh, that will bring us to the basic teaching of three domains and compare the opportunity uh, to current um, needs in their organization. So why? Why we need to learn about simulation? This is how much it costs to hurt someone in the Western world. The whole idea that we are here, education, educators, students, learners, is to produce a safe doctor because we deal with human beings. It's all about safety. If we fail in safety, there's absolutely no need to be a doctor or a healthcare professional. And that's where the whole idea has come from. It's about safety and, yes, about cost in the Western world, but still safety is number one. Okay? Is, is, is it sound right? Does everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Um, I love feedback, so someone can give me feedback about this. Okay. Right? So, types of medical errors. We know we can make errors in diagnosing people. We can hurt people. There's a lot of invasive and interventional diagnostic tools available to us. We certainly can, heat, uh, can hurt people in treatment, particularly surgeons. We do a bad stuff to people. And also, uh, in a screening program, try to prevent uh, diseases and illnesses. There's other ways of hurting people, which other people touch about it. Communications, and this is across the globe. This simple word or transfer or a handover or misinterpretation can kill people. And I'm sure we all be through this either on a personal level or we come across it. So communication is the big thing. Okay? Look at this. This is crazy. If you look at the 70% of sentimental evidence come from poor communication, that's just crazy. Okay? So effective communication and teamwork enhance the quality of patient care. Focus shift from intra, you communicate with yourself, you organize yourself, you plan, 
through other your colleagues and other disciplines, okay? So, this is a well-known fact, we know this. Uh, leading healthcare organization driving improved patient outcomes, World Health Organization and Joint Commission, the benefit of interprofessional or professionality will improve patient outcome. So why, uh, what is simulation? Let's just come back to basics, just come back to what we're talking about. So it's a technique, not technology, to replace or amplify real experiences with guided experiences, often immersive in nature, that evoke or replicate substantial aspects of real world in a fully interactive. Everyone can read this. If you need a reference, you can look at it. We all know this, and that's why my lecture is a bad idea for you. Because you're not going to learn anything. This is how much you're going to learn from lectures. The first five, ten minutes you're going to listen to me and then all of you are going to fall asleep. And I don't blame you because I do the same thing. Okay? So that's, that's why the demo comes. Look at the teaching others. Look how much you learn, how much you retain when you teach others. Okay? Look at the practice when you practice something. We in the surgical field of intervention, interventional speciality, we know this. You do the operation once, you learn it straight away. You read about it 100 times, you still can't learn it. We live this on a daily basis. But this is the pyramid that we, we should believe in and should practice. It's not always easy. There's a lot of factors involved in this. Okay? So, why simulation is a growing issue? We do complex stuff. We do a lot of stuff nowadays. You can't practice in a human body. You can't practice in a human being. You've got more procedures, more interventions, more regulation. Lawyers are waiting for you outside. You know, you, you're going to go to, you know, nowadays there's so much restriction, there's so much hammering down on medical practice. If you look at the medical insurance and indemnity in the Western world, it's crazy. The people pay like a half a million dollars just to be insured to practice. People don't make half a million dollars a year nowadays. So it's, it's not an easy business. So this guy here, he's uh, summarized the future of the best practice in simulation based that could be a lead to effective learning. It's not just, the, the nice thing about simulation hands on, it's about effective learning. And we learned so far from excellent previous speakers, what is effective learning? It's an integrated learning. It's knowledge, skills, attitude, professionalism, communication. If you can integrate that in one setting, that's what you need. But if you talk about them for an hour, you're not going to get a lot. Okay? So, you plan your simulation, your simulation educator, simulation educator should plan how and when feedback will be provided. Okay? So, protocols of learning simulation, you set up the scene, you briefing, what are you going to achieve from the simulation, what are you going to learn, you set up your goals. So, you bring in the theory, the practice, the knowledge, the attitude in a real life scenario. So, you plan. Pre briefing, the pre simulation talk. What is your goals? What are you going to achieve? What are the rules? The general talk about safety environment. Safety for you, how to be respectable to your uh, mannequin, how to be respectable to your cadaver, how you be respectable to the machines. Psychological safety, preparation, planning. This is all in the pre briefing. So you can bring a lot of stuff in the simulation teaching. And then the third bit, which has become a growing issue, is Dr. Sinusi touched on about providing feedback. We discussed in a workshop yesterday about feedback. We wish we had more time to play the feedback scenario. So you can live it. You can, this is like a simulation business. The feedback is about do it and practice it and, and, and live it in a daily life. We all give a feedback. We give back to our children, to our colleagues. To everyone, so it's part of life. But when it comes to learning and proficient, and it's proved beyond any doubt, is a very effective learning technique. 
So why should we stimulate for learning? You control the sequential tasks you offer to learners. You have opportunity to provide support and guidance. You prevent unsafe and dangerous situations. Greatest task, or cr create the task that really occur in real life, because now sir, there's some complex operation in every surgical field, some intervention thing. It's the best chance to practice them in a simulation scenario. So, human patient simulator, standardized patient, there's a lot of research and evidence about what is the best learning method among the simulation techniques and methods. Standardized patient, human patient, you'd be surprised how much research has been done about this? Different ways, technology, in all the specialty. I'm not just talking about surgery here, I'm talking about all the specialty. Cardiac, kids, um, surgical specialities, everywhere. So, microsim in hospital has become available in the biggest and advanced institutions now. You'd be surprised, or really, if you go on YouTube, you can watch this, the Microsoft business. It's a huge development. So you learn a lot from it. You can, you can watch it as if you're there. So you can assess all the parameters, you can assess everything in the patient. VR, visual reality, you know, we, we all love it. Computer technology, simulation in the machine. So there's there's the dimensions, there's 11 dimensions of the, um, of the simulation in general, but we need to, need to know from the start what's the purpose and the aims of a simulation activity. Why are you doing this? Why do you want to get out of it? Okay? Time of knowledge, skills, attitudes, behavior, unit of participation in simulation, experience in simulation, healthcare domain. There's a lot of things you can learn. I'm just going to run through quickly. I don't want to bore you with this. Okay? And then you finish off. You finish off with your brief debriefing. Well, you know, you know this, is, this is bringing all the other skills and knowledge and education on a simulation scenario. You can, you can judge and assist the feeling of the participant. Um, you, 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 you try to summarize up. You try to get the facts after the teaching and experience process. Understanding and exploring the participant perspective on the scenario. So you can bring in, in your scenario, in the simulation, a lot of education, a lot of tools, a lot of learning experience. So we know all the feedback, what worked well, what should be changed next time, a major take-home message. Okay? Remember psychological safety, we talked about it, we talked about enhanced uh, teamwork and collaboration, and you can improve about critical thinking, you can improve judgment, you can improve organization culture. There's a lot of things you can do. There's a lot of research supporting this. You can look it up if you like, but I don't want to bore you with this. Lunch is waiting. Patient outcomes. We all know that. Okay, so this is the biggest thing, which I'm gonna run very quickly. Is it profitable? Is simulation profitable? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. Do you make money out of it? No. Sorry? No. No. You say no. Save money. You save money. How? Save money. But technology is very really expensive. So this is your power of motivators. It's a lower cost. We'll come to it how it's going to be a lower cost. Safety. Absolutely. It can cost you to pay out for hurting someone. That's why you need to do the maths. You need to do the calculations. It costs you a lot from the lawyers just to damage you, hurt someone, okay? Put an accident to symptoms cases, reduce training time, reduce errors. Reality is we should all invest. A return, what's your return on investment? That's how it works. You're paying a lot of money, you're saving a lot of money later. That's how it works. Cost saving, this is how much it costs in a catheter-related bloodstream infection. Just a simple procedure how much money they save by just simulating the technique to their student. It's a lot of money. And you can make money down the You can teach, you can charge people, you can make money out of this. Okay? How quick is that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.